So finally, in this lecture, we're going to discuss the famous and important Schrodinger equation of quantum mechanics. Now, what exactly is this equation? Where does it actually come from? And what important information does this equation provide us with? These are some of the questions we're going to discuss in this lecture. So let's begin by recalling a very important principle in quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics basically incorporates the wave-particle duality of matter. That is, a system can act as a wave or it can act as a particle. Now in quantum mechanics, we describe any system such as an electron by using a quantity known as the wave function. Now when we treat our system such as our electron as a wave in that case the wave function represents the displacement or amplitude of the wave produced by that electron on the other hand if we treat our system once again for example our electron as a particle then in this case the wave function allows us to calculate the probability of finding that particle that electron at some moment in time and some location in space. More specifically, to calculate the probability, we take the square of the absolute value of the wave function, which is, by the way, given by the Greek letter psi. Now, what exactly does this tell us? Well, basically, in order to be able to describe any system such as our electron in quantum mechanics, we must be able to determine the wave function numerically. And that's exactly where the Schrodinger equation actually comes into play. The Schrodinger equation is basically a differential equation that we use to solve for the wave function quantitatively. So basically the wave function is a solution to the Schrodinger equation which itself, which itself is a differential equation. Now the question is where exactly does the Schrodinger equation actually come from? Can we actually derive the Schrodinger equation from some underlying principle? Well, in the same way that Sir Isaac Newton invented the second law of motion, so basically Isaac Newton invented F equals M times A to describe what happens to an object when a net force acts on it, and then that equation was basically confirmed experimentally, the Schrodinger equation was also invented and was tested and confirmed experimentally. So this means that there is no way to actually derive the Schrodinger equation in the same exact way. There is no way to actually derive the equation F equals M times A. These equations are basically equations that can be readily confirmed experimentally and cannot actually be derived in any way. Now, the question still remains. What does the Schrodinger equation actually look like? What form does this equation take? So basically, in order to determine the form that the equation takes, we will use the conservation of energy. So that's the idea that we're going to use to determine what the Schrodinger equation is. Now, in this particular lecture, we will also assume that the wave function that we are dealing with does not actually depend on time. And the wave function only depends on the spatial position of our system lying along the x-axis. So, psi, the wave function, only depends on x and is independent of the time. So that basically means since the Schrodinger equation has a solution that is equal to the wave function and the wave function is time independent, that means the Schrodinger equation that we're going to determine in this lecture is also time independent. 
Now, a second form, a more complicated form of the Schrodinger equation that we're going to address in a future lecture is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So, in this lecture, we're, going, we're only going to focus on the time-independent Schrodinger equation. So, let's begin our determination of this equation by looking at the following diagram. Let's suppose that a particle is moving along the x-axis and no forces are actually acting on that particle. So that means our particle is in fact a free particle. So, for example, we have an electron that is moving along the x-axis in a positive direction. No forces act on that particle, so that means that the energy of our particle is constant. And that implies that the momentum of that particle is also constant. Now, we know that Lewis de Broglie basically told us that our momentum P of our particle is equal to H divided by lambda. Now, if we take our equation and solve for lambda, the wavelength of the wave produced by the particle, that is equal to H divided by P. So, we see that since H is a constant and P is also a constant because no forces are assumed to act on the particle, then for this particular case, the wavelength is also constant. So, let's begin with step one. So, to basically describe the wave produced by a particle such as this electron moving along the x-axis, we might expect that the wave function satisfies a differential equation that is similar to the classical equation of our wave that is given by the following formula. So our wave function psi with respect to x and t our position and time is equal to a a constant multiplied by sine of kx minus omega t plus b another constant multiplied by cosine of kx minus omega multiplied by t. Once again, this is the classical wave equation for mechanical and electromagnetic waves. Now, since we are assuming that our time is independent, that is, the Schrodinger equation is independent of time and only depends on the spatial position x along the x-axis, we can set t equal to zero. Then this disappears, this disappears, and this also disappears. So we see that psi, our wave function, with respect to x is equal to a sine kx plus b cosine kx. Let's label this equation as equation 1. So, what exactly is the importance of equation 1? What does it actually give us? Well, this equation gives us the equation of the wave function for a free particle, a particle that does not actually feel any force. And this equation is important because it gives us the solution to the Schrodinger equation. So, Basically, whatever the time-independent Schrodinger equation actually looks like, that equation has to have a solution that satisfies equation 1. And that is the importance of this equation. Now, what exactly is K? Well, k is a constant, and it's equal to 2 pi divided by lambda. We know that from classical physics. Now, lambda from this equation is h divided by p. So we go from this equation to this equation by replacing lambda with h divided by p. Now, we can take the 2, by, or the two pi and bring it to the bottom, and we see that k is equal to p divided by h divided by 2 pi. So this denominator denominator is equal to h bar, where, where h bar is a constant and is equal to 1.055 times 10 to negative 34 joules multiplied by seconds. Now, so k is equal to p divided by h bar, so k is a constant, and k is given by these two quantities. So, 
Now let's move on to step two. So in step two, we're still looking at this diagram. So now let's suppose we want to apply the conservation of energy. So since this particle is moving along the x-axis in the positive direction with a velocity that is constant given by V and a mass M, then the total energy of our particle, our system E, is equal to the sum of the kinetic energy of the particle and the potential energy. So E is equal to K plus U. Now, in this lecture, we're going to focus on non-relativistic kinetic energy. So that means the non-relativistic kinetic energy K is equal to one-half M times V squared. Now, what exactly is V? Well, recall that our momentum P is equal to M times V, and that implies that our V is equal to P divided by M. So we can replace our V with P divided by M, and we get this result. So E, the total energy of our particle, is equal to P squared divided by 2M plus U, the potential energy, where this is our non-relativistic kinetic energy. Now, from this equation, we know that K is equal to P divided by H bar. Now, we can rearrange this equation and we see that P is equal to K multiplied by H bar. So now we replace our P with K multiplied by H bar, and this gives us equation 2. So we label this as equation 2. So we saw in step 1 that equation 1 gives us the general form of the solution, the wave function, which is the solution of the Schrodinger equation. And in step two, what this equation actually tells us is, it tells us that whatever the time independent Schrodinger equation actually looks like, it has to satisfy, it has to look like equation two. So once again, we conclude the following important points. Whatever the Schrodinger equation looks like, it must satisfy equation two, which comes from the conservation of energy and the solution of this Schrodinger equation must take the form of equation one. Now, in the next part of this lecture, we're actually going to use these two facts to determine what the time-independent Schrodinger equation actually looks like. So let us now continue from where we just left off. So from section 1 and section 2, we saw that we are trying to find a one-dimensional time-independent differential equation known as the Schrodinger equation that looks like equation 2 and which has a solution known as the wave function that has the form of equation 1. So if we are to determine any differential equation, we actually need a differential equation to work with. So let's take equation 1 and let's take the second derivative of equation 1 with respect to x. So the second derivative of our psi with respect to x is equal to negative k squared a constant multiplied by a sine kx plus b cosine kx, where a and b are constants, k is equal to p divided by our h bar, and x is simply our position of our particle along our x-axis. So because we're only examining one dimension, one axis, this equation is in fact a one-dimensional differential equation. Now, let's look at the following inner portion. So a sine kx plus b cosine kx is simply equation one and it's equal to psi with respect to x. So this inner portion is simply equal to psi with respect to x, our wave function. So this is equal to the following equation. So 
uh, d2, so basically our derivative, second derivative of the wave function with respect to x is equal to negative k squared multiplied by our psi with respect to x. So let's call this equation 3. So notice equation 3 is in fact a differential equation. So that means we're one step closer to determining what the one-dimensional time-independent Schrodinger equation is. So the next goal is to basically take equation 2 and make equation 2 look like equation 3. So notice that both equation 2 and equation 3 have something in common. They have the k squared term in common, which appears on the right side of equation 3 and which appears on the right side, the first term of equation 2. So, let's take equation 3 and multiply both sides of equation 3 by the term negative h bar divided by 2m. Remember, we're trying to make equation 2 look like equation 3. So if we multiply both sides by negative h bar divided by 2m, which is basically this uh, fraction here, we get the following result. So negative h bar divided by 2m multiplied by the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x is equal to h bar squared multiplied by k squared divided by 2m multiplied by the wave function with respect to x. Finally, let's take equation uh, 2 and multiply the left and the right side of equation 2 by our wave function with respect to x. So the left side becomes e multiplied by psi with respect to x is equal to this quantity becomes k squared, our bar squared, bar h squared divided by 2m multiplied by psi x plus u with respect to x multiplied by our psi with respect to x. So, now let's take a closer look at this equation. Notice that the first term that appears on the right side of the following equation is simply this quantity. So we have h bar squared multiplied by k squared divided by 2m multiplied by this, and this entire thing is equal to this quantity. So if we replace this with this, we get the following result. So e multiplied by our psi with respect to x is equal to u, which is also with respect to x, multiplied by psi with respect to x minus h bar, divided by 2m, multiplied by the second derivative of the wave function with respect to x. So, this is exactly the one-dimensional, time-independent Schrodinger equation that we were looking for. Notice that we did not actually derive this equation, but rather we determined this equation and then to actually confirm and test whether or not this equation actually works, we have to conduct experiments and see whether or not this equation actually fits fits the experimental result.